Pipi, 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 pipi. How many different ways can you think of to say pipi? Pipi, 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 pipi. pipi. Hmm. Lots of different ways. Interesting. Two sort simple words. We've already made the pee pee. Now we've got to figure out how to get rid of it. And here comes the bladder. So here's the structure of the bladder. You see the two ureters coming down. Uh, sorry, this is chapter 20, part 2. And we're talking about all the other extraneous stuff besides the kidney. Uh, the bladder is made of transitional epithelium. It also has a smooth muscle wall on the interior. This epithelium can stretch, so it's collapsible, can shrink down, it can expand when it fills with pee, and it temporarily stores urine, and that stretch you'll see is going to communicate with the brain and say, I gotta go pee pee. Uh, at the base of the bladder we have what is called the trigone. Okay, it's uh, essentially three different openings that make up the, the base, the bottom is the, the bottom of the triangle, and then the two entries of the ureters are the uh, second aspect or the other, the second and third. Um, two from the ureters, one from the urethra. You see here the, the opening to the urethra right there. And it's very sensitive to stretch. Um, as the uh, bladder begins to distend, you have uh, neural messages being sent back to the brain saying you gotta go. And you'll see we have two sphincters. One is voluntary, one is involuntary. This uh, detrusor muscle, as we call it, or distrusor muscle, sometimes people say, um, there's multiple layers of it, okay, and then on the inside we have the transitional epithelium that we've talked about, um, and the walls are super folded and convoluted because it's all shrunken down, allowing it to expand when the pressure increases internally. The urethra that goes at the bottom of the bladder uh, is a thin tube. It carries urine from the bladder to the outside. It uses peristalsis, so ring-like muscles that squeeze one after the other to push the urine down. It, of course, happens very quickly. Uh, and then we have the two sphincters. The first one is internal. The internal urethral sphincter is involuntary. When you really have to go, this one's already open, and you're doing everything you can to hold it in. On a general basis, it's closed, okay? The, only the stretch signals for that smooth muscle to open. The external sphincter is voluntary. You get to choose whether you want to uh, micturate or not. Now, there are differences in the urethra, of course. In females, it's very short, about one inch, anywhere from three to four centimeters. Uh, and in males, it's about eight inches. Yes, size matters, especially if you're a male, because you need a longer urethra to make it all the way out the penis uh, and from the bladder, whereas females, the bladder is very close to the, uh, to the opening. Um, in females, there it is uh, along the wall of the vagina, and in males, it has to go through various organs, including the prostate, and then out the penis, as I mentioned. In females, it only carries urine. In males, it carries both urine and is a passageway for sperm cells and for semen. So yes, both of them go through the same tube in males, but in females it only carries urine, of course, because they don't produce sperm. That'd be weird. Uh, micturition, the act of voiding or emptying your bladder. Uh, the internal sphincter gets relaxed when the bladder stretches. An impulse is sent back from the spinal cord. It's a reflex. Uh, and then the external sphincter must only be done voluntarily. The internal one is a, is a reflex, automatically done directly through the spinal cord. Um, now, water balance, most females are going to carry about 50% water. Uh, in part, that's because they have a higher percent body fat and fat doesn't like water, whereas males have a higher percent uh, of musculature, they have 60% water. More muscle requires more water. Uh, babies, even higher, 75%. Um, and then when you get old, you carry only 45%. And this is part of the reason why you get wrinkly and, and uh, saggy looking. Uh, water is necessary. Why? Well, all different kinds of body functions that we won't detail too much, and levels of those are important. Where is most of the, the water? Well, most of it is found inside the cells, the intracellular fluid volume, okay? And then we also have, that's about 40% of your body weight. And then um, the other 20% is extracellular fluid. So this means interstitial fluid, that which is between the cells, and then also the blood plasma is also largely water, uh, about three liters of it, and that's uh, the other portion of the body fluid. Um, we already talked about previously in the questions that we did that uh, water always follows salt, okay? So changes in electrolyte balance has a real strong effect on how much you're gonna pee and, and your water balance. When you move salt or electrolytes from one area to another, water is gonna follow, and this helps to manipulate your blood volume and your blood pressure, which are, of course, tied. Um, and it can also impact activity of cells. If you have 
too much salt in an area, it draws all the water, you won't have enough water in that cell for certain specific functions. So uh, water intake must be equal to water output in your body. It does a pretty good job of this. If you're dehydrated, you're not going to pee as much. If you're very well hydrated, you're going to pee a lot more. Uh, food and fluids take in water, and also water gets produced from certain metabolic processes. But um, one thing is that you don't need to worry about that whole eight glasses a day of water. That's a load of crap. Uh, there's no scientific evidence showing that. There's no scientist that has ever said that. Um, that's uh, based on hearsay. Uh, everybody needs a different amount of water, and healthy amounts vary uh, for each individual based on uh, size and sex and how much you exercise and body composition and so on. How do you output water? Well, you breathe some out just in every day, uh, your tidal volume, you're breathing in and out. Uh, that's vaporization out of the lungs as gas. Some of it, of course, you lose in perspiration. Uh, some of it leaves the body through your feces when you poop it out, sometimes more than you really want. Yes, I know. Gross. And then sometimes when you go pee pee, you're in production. Uh, dilute urine is produced if you take in too much. And then um, less urine is going to be produced if uh, it's more concentrated if large amounts of water are lost or you don't take in enough. You're, you're dehydrated, essentially. So you have, it's really important to maintain osmotic balance, water balance, um, and electrolytes are important. You may lose some through your pee as well. Now, how do you largely regulate how much to pee and how much electrolytes to maintain and so on? It's mostly dictated or affected on the uh, collecting duct by two main hormones, okay? ADH antidiuretic hormone, which prevents excess water loss. And then aldosterone regulates sodium ion content, which as a result or as a byproduct manipulates water concentration as well. Um, and aldosterone is triggered by the renin angiotensin system. Those are other hormones. Renin comes from the kidney. Aldosterone doesn't. You might remember aldosterone comes from the uh, adrenal glands um, that then act directly on the kidneys. But uh, ADH and aldosterone help to regulate water and electrolyte balance. And then there's uh, receptors in the kidneys and then also in the hypothalamus that regulate uh, your electrolyte balance and your water balance and then send the message how much of these hormones to release or block them and so on. And this is showing you how that whole system works with the various uh, the sympathetic and, and uh, sympathetic nervous system. Um, you can see here the adrenal cortex secreting aldosterone, affects the kidney tubules to reabsorb more sodium, and that's increasing blood volume, you're going to pee less, okay? Um, here's the different kinds of receptors that we're talking about. Um, you get the idea, okay? So uh, you know that the kidneys are also, one of their functions is to maintain uh, acid-base balance, and this is important through their uh, manipulation of uh, buffers and the ion concentrations. So blood pH, it's really important that it stays between 735 and 745. We talked before that if it's above 745, it's too basic. And it's, you're, you have alkalosis. If it's below 735, you have acidosis. Now, this is the blood, not the urine. Urine pH may fluctuate more significantly based on what you're peeing out, but blood cannot fluctuate. Now, it's got to stay in that very small window. Um, all right. So this acid-base balance is maintained by the kidneys based on how much you pump out, and also by blood buffers and by breathing, by uh, respiration. Okay. Uh, buffers in the blood that uh, help to manipulate this um, include molecules, or they are molecules that are going to react with hydrogen ions. So hydrogen ions dictate the pH of something. The more hydrogen ions there are in solution, the more acidic something is. A chemical or a molecule that binds to hydrogen ions and takes them out of solution, that's going to make the solution more basic. Okay? A molecule that gives off hydrogen ions in solution, that's going to make the solution more acidic. So buffers modify these by binding and releasing hydrogen ions. When they bind the hydrogen ions, as I said, pH drops or gets lower, more acidic. When they release hydrogen ions, oh, that's wrong. When they bind hydrogen ions, the pH drops. That, in fact, it should say they get more positive or higher number, more basic. When, uh, when buffers um, release hydrogen ions, the pH is going to get more acidic or a smaller pH number. We've talked before about the bicarbonate buffer system. We've not talked about the phosphate buffer system, but it works in a similar way. And then the protein buffer system also in a similar way, as, as I mentioned. But the details of those are, are um, not overly important. We'll touch on them here briefly. Bicarbonate. So we talked before, H2CO3 is carbonic acid, has two hydrogen ions that are freely available to give off. And it goes back and forth between sodium bicarbonate, you see here, and, the, and carbon, carbonic acid. It's in equilibrium between the two. 
Bicarbonate ions can react with strong acids and make them weak because it has the ability to bind another hydrogen ion. Whereas carbonic acid is a weak acid, it dissociates in the presence of a strong base, like uh, um, NaOH, for example, and it can take that strong base and make it into a, a weaker one. Uh, and that's essentially how buffers work. Um, so your kidneys have the ability to mess with or manipulate your acid-base balance because they can um, excrete or reabsorb bicarbonate because they can excrete or reabsorb hydrogen ions, and these things are occurring at the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule. So you can manipulate your concentrations of these buffers. Um, and as a result, that's going to significantly manipulate your uh, urine pH based on how much of those buffers you are excreting into your urine. How did your kidney develop? Well, by about the third month, you have functional kidneys, and they are working and you are creating some urine that then gets mixed in with the amniotic fluid. I know, weird. The bladder of a newborn is teeny, teeny, tiny, and the urine cannot be really concentrated. It's mostly just water. And this is why newborns go pee all the time, and sometimes on the parent. Yes, been there, done that. Um, the big problem with babies is they can't control their sphincters. Remember, the internal sphincter is involuntary. It's smooth muscle, it's a reflex. But the, the external sphincter is voluntary, except in a baby, they can't control it yet. So as soon as that internal sphincter opens, whoosh, out comes the pee everywhere. Um, not until about 18 months of age can they then learn to, uh, to keep that sphincter flexed and to hold the urine in there so it doesn't come out. So theoretically, you could potty train at 18 months. Um, we've already, we talked a little bit today about uh, UTIs, urinary tract infections. Um, that's the typical problem associated with uh, the urinary system before you get old. We did talk about um, kidney stones can be a problem, but uh, less common than UTIs and so on. And UTIs are treatable, both with antibiotics and by other means. Uh, your urinary function declines as you get older, and your bladder shrinks with, as you get older, so you start to pee more often. Um, and in males, sometimes, even though you're going pee more often, you're peeing out less. So you feel like you really, really got to go, and then there's just this little trickle. Old men hate this, uh, this urinary retention, and they go, they have to wake up all the time at night. Every two hours they're peeing, and it's very little. So it can be pretty frustrating for an older uh, individual. And on that pee-pee note, I'm pee-pee. Pee-pee, 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 pee-pee.